one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ladies Tell podcast. I just would like to take this moment right here. First of all, there's no Jade, so you know I'm not going to behave, and I'm loving the fact that I'm not going to behave. I'd like to take this moment right here and say the moment that I hit the record button, my throat was like and dry. So now I'm like, oh, if you'll excuse me for a moment, I'm going to get water. So if you see me leave sometime during this interview, it's because I went to go get water not because I went like shopping or, you know, had to grab a hot dog off the grill or something like that. Oh, hot dogs on the grill. I might start the grill. I might get water and then start the grill. Anyway, not important. Since Jade's not here, that's a horrible rambling rant and I apologize. I should say that, oh, I have a co-host today. Co-host, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, this is Tanya Todd and I'm excited to be here. Thank you, wait. That's not nearly as like long as it normally is. There's normally like three more sentences. Well, what? you didn't say mention what I do, but I, I'm an author and actress and a screenwriter, but I'm excited to speak with a producer, even Thank though it's not you. even my field. I just, I looked into her and she's done some amazing things. I think she's a rock star and I'm just one to bask in her greatness. <laughs> she says she's not a producer, but she produced my little lovely script. I'm just saying. Moving on. She's a baby producer. She's like big time. <laughs> moving on we wrote books and when I say me we I do not mean that there's like two personalities living in this one body although it would be cool and ultra cool and then maybe a third one would be like oh my goodness hair flip narcissist oh wait I can't do that right today that's the first personality (laughs) (laughs) all right so the books are and I thought divorce was bad and I thought being grown up was easy if only I were me a memoir on first widow's web widow's debt and foreign coffee and if you're counting with me this is the point where if you watch the show like a thousand and one times you know how many books I have because I'm about to do the math and you know I'm going to add a little sign language so that's six books and if you're counting with me you're going to be like well where's the other 17 so that's 11 more books that are can be found on www.endithoughtladies.com okay add it all together y'all and we get 17 books and if you were wondering what is this that's the 17 in sign language I love doing this when Jade's not here I get to sign okay one more thing for the narcissist that's inside of me you know I gotta do it like this because Jade ain't here for like a car dealer so you can find out everything you ladies are up to at www.endithoughtladies.com but you're not here to hear about me you're here to hear about our wonderful guest wonderful guest would you like to introduce yourself wow that feels a bit like a personality switch I have whiplash. It's so good. (laughs) I'm Meredith Prunkard. I am an executive producer for reality TV. I am, um, I love all things bulldogs and I'm a vegan animal rights activist. Okay. I was going to start off with vegan and you threw that in as your third and I'm sorry for not being professional, but uh, what's your favorite vegan recipe and how can I make it? Oh, okay. I'm a terrible cook. So, um, so all of my recipes are very simple. Um, and so I think, so what, and I go through like phases, right? Like I'm like a phase person when it comes to food. So I'll eat the same thing every day for like three weeks and then I'll hate it forever and I'll never eat it again. Um, but I'm currently, it's probably going to sound gross, but I'm currently really into this egg salad. It's like a vegan egg salad. And I put it in these like chickpea tortilla things. It's so good. And it's ground tofu and, um, cashew milk and, or no, sorry, ground tofu, cashews, soaked cashews, and then like a bunch of spices and stuff and pickles, and then also celery. And then the PS. Okay, you're right. It sounds gross. <laughs> so gross. Lost me at the pickles, man. But the best part about it, this is going to be like the worst ever, is it's called Kala Namak and it's like black Himalayan salt. And it's like gives it that like egg flavor because it has like a sulfur kind of like vibe to it. You guys are like. Okay. Um, I was cool with the cashews, the spices and the tofu with the cat. Yeah, they, I was cool with all of that. And then we got to the sulfur and I was like, yeah, no, thank you. How did you discover this monstrosity? Um, The same place I discover all of my recipes, which is TikTok. Okay. That explains a lot. Yeah. Everything that I make. I I mean, actually, I make like a regular vegan came up with this, you know? I know. I know. It's like, I'm not being a very good vegan ambassador right now because (laughs) I should be like giving delicious recipes, but that is like my current recipe. 
Um, I, I do make a really good like dumpling, which is also like ground tofu and then carrots and garlic and all kinds of like good spices. And then you wrap it up in a spring roll and then you grill them and they're so good. And you put like a soy sauce, you make like a soy sauce, um, sesame oil sauce with some like chili, um, what is it? This sam sambal olek chili paste stuff. It's so good. And then you dip it. It's awesome. That How sounds amazing. Been a vegan? What's that? How long have you been a vegan? Um, let's see. This year will be in August. It will be 12 or in August. It'll be a decade, 10 years. Wow. Yeah. Pretty wild. I'm so only vegan when I have a long vegan. list of recipes because you, you've been in the trenches for a while. <laughs> oh, yeah. But that's, I mean, the problem is that I just like hate cooking so much. So I only get elaborate when it's, um, when there's like guests over, like I do have some like really great recipes for like a vegan Alfredo and like all, like all kinds of regular stuff, like vegan pizza and like stuff that is actually delicious to other people and not just myself. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I'm so weird and like have no patience. Um, so I do have some, but like the ones that I'm currently making are like the ones that are like the front of my brain. Okay, a vegan Alfredo I love. Like, I can give you the, the recipe to put in the show notes if you guys want. And it's, um, Issa, it's from Issa Chandra's holiday cookbook. And it is amazing. Everybody freaks out over it. It's like made, it's like a cashew base. It's so good. That sounds amazing. That's a great idea. Yeah. Because the you know, like the vegan Alfredo that you buy in the store is like $9 a jar. Yeah. And it's like not, I don't know. There's something about that like process jar alfredo it's just like not the same so you make it yourself in a blender and it is like so amazing you she know makes ours from scratch in a blender and i have not the faintest idea what she make puts in there i do not care and we have it with shiitake mushroom noodles mm. and the uh vegan italian sausage oh my gosh from uh beyond the beyond sausage yeah. oh my god they're so good they're so good. When I said I was going to go get a hot dog off the grill, that's what I was talking that's about. That's what you meant. <laughs> like, Don't say that when you have a vegan guest. <laughs> I'm going I haven't even started the grill yet, so it's going to be a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I did want to discuss one more thing, and then I'm going to hand the show over to Tanya because I feel like you and Tanya will have a lot. I mean, baby producer to like big boss producer will have a lot to chat about. <laughs> Besides, can I be on a reality show? Um, <laughs> my, my other question is that you you faced a lot of personal challenges, like getting to where you are, like where you came from, some some health issues. We I find health issues are always the biggest one because that is insane. Because that it doesn't go anywhere when you have a health issue. How did you how do you cope with that with the busy lifestyle of a producer? I have spent so many years like really trying to figure out how to get to the root causes of my like ailments. And that's really, and it's been such a journey and I think it'll be a lifelong journey, but there's been so much progress made that um, that, that kind of like keeps me moving forward. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a whole other job, right? Like outside of like what I do for a living. Um, except for it's like super expensive and it doesn't, I don't make any money off of it, but it, like, it is so, it has, it has improved my life so much because it's, it's helped me to understand my body a lot more. Do you know that like women don't really even understand our own periods or like why, like I never did. I still kind of don't. And doctors don't, it's just like, oh, you have them. Here's like an IUD or you have them. Here's some birth control pills or here's, or take like medicine. that's going to like fuck your stomach up or whatever. Sorry. Can I, should I not be swearing? You already did it. Keep going. Keep going. I, I, but it's been, it's just been tons and tons of research and, and seeking out like holistic practitioners and kind of, you know, staying away from conventional medicine as much as possible. It's not, you can't avoid it completely, nor would you want to, but like, um, really trying to, you know, getting, um, you know, finding people who actually listen and care about like getting to the root cause instead of just giving putting a band-aid on it but it's helped me so much and it's helped me be more available for my work because I'm feeling better you know so like that's been a big thing um did you want me to like walk through like what I've like what I've dealt with or 
it's what you feel comfortable sharing with our audience because i know how comfortable i feel sharing my stuff so it's what you feel comfortable sharing. okay got it well there's been two kind of big obstacles health-wise that i've dealt with um pretty much like forever but um it's not been until like the past decade that i've really started to kind of like try to figure everything out and one of them is that i um I just had like crippling back pain forever. And that was something that um, I just learned to live with because it was ever since I could remember, like I've always had terrible back pain. And so um, when I was about 33, so this was like, you know, nine years ago or so, um, I found out that I had, well, I, I finally was like, I'm just gonna take it into my own hands. I'm gonna like try to figure it out instead of just taking ibuprofen every single day. So I started going to doctors and surgeons and like getting all the imaging done. And I had like CAT scans and MRIs and like all that stuff. And they came back and they were like, we were really sorry to tell you this, but um, you are inoperable. Like you, your back is so terrible. And it's, um, you know, if you look at your, your CT scans from a doctor's perspective, it looks like you are like an 80 year old retired NFL player. Like your back is jacked. And they're like, you should start making preparations to be in a wheelchair. They're like, you have about two years left of mobility in your in your um, of like of mobility period, and and then you should like really start mentally preparing for not being able to walk. And it just and I have like all kinds of things, right? Like I have like nine issues, and and none of them like I don't know. Like I've since done all the research. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't seem like necessarily crippling, but I whatever, like I have spondylolisthesis where my back, my lumbar spine is pushed forward by like six or seven millimeters. And then I have like all of my discs are degenerated and slipped. And then um, I have like bone spurs, I have stenosis of the spine. So like, and then other things. So I have all of these things um, and they were like, that's what's causing the pain. You, it's only gonna get, it's progressive. It's only gonna get worse, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I was, I was like kind of depressed, you know, but I had just signed on to do a show and I was leaving to go be in the field for like four months to shoot it, um, out of state. So I just packed and it was like the next day I was leaving. So I just packed my bags up and I was like, I told myself, I was like, I'm not going to, um, even think about it. I'm just, because I'm kind of, I kind of don't believe it. So I'm just going to put it on my head, but then I couldn't, it's all I thought about. So for the next four months, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Cause I was like, so focused on it. And um, by the end of the shoot, and I remember it was like December and I came home for Christmas and I was just like a wreck and I ended up being bedridden. And um, during that time, I told my husband, Ben, I was like, hey, there's a book that somebody got me. like." two years ago at that point, somebody had bought me a book and they were like, it's called Healing Back Pain, you should read it. And at the time I was like, my back pain is way, way like beyond like a self-help book. Like it's, there's nothing that is gonna, so I never read it. I was just like, thanks. And then I like put it with the, all the other books I haven't read. And um, so I was like, can you go find it? Cause I'm like rock bottom. So I should probably like, do, I'll do anything at this point. So I read the book, it's called Healing Back Pain by Dr. John Sarno. And I literally like, when I was done reading the book, my back felt, just by reading it, my back felt like 70% better. It was crazy. I got out of bed and I was like, oh my God, I haven't been out of bed in four days. This is insane. Um, and from there, I, I found a, um, psycho a chronic pain spe like psychologist. And I worked with him to just try to, rewire the way that I think about my back pain and it worked like it was insane like I had a lifetime of like horrible horrible back pain like so much stiffness it was like hard to move my lower back um walking always was difficult and I went from that to like being almost pain-free it sounds like and the ultimate mind over matter it totally is so he's his whole thing is it's called tension myo tension myoneural syndrome and the idea of it is like, so first of all, he's like a spine surgeon. He passed away a few years ago, um, but he was, he was in his heyday. He was like the, the late sixties, early seventies. And he was frustrated because he was like, people aren't, um, 
people are are coming in and they're and they have all this pain and we're doing images and we're saying oh well these things are wrong with it so that must be what's causing you pain so we'll just do surgery or whatever he's like but in reality there's no like medical proof that these issues actually cause pain so he was like i started thinking about it differently and i started doing more research and then kind of like experimenting on my patients and being like okay well do you have repressed rage because really what it is is it's a lack of like it's oxygen deprivation to that area and so your body and this should be no surprise to anybody but your brain tries to protect right you from sadness or whatever so it'll distract you with pain somewhere so when people get stressed and they get headaches or they get stressed and their back goes out or they get stressed and like things just start to go wrong physically like it happens all the time you get ulcers or whatever well that's your body trying to your or your brain trying to protect you from like the they're like your brain's like oh she can't handle this emotional distress so we'll just distract her with this like bodily issue structural problem or whatever and um and so it was just like the realization of that it's not even me having to like work through my you know like my you know emotional trauma it was just like being aware that the pain is caused because my brain is like trying to protect myself like even as i'm telling the story i can feel my back my back, i had like a bad back morning and i can even feel it like loosening up it's like just knowing that and like really truly understanding it has helped me and that was in 2016 and it's now 2022 and i've literally never been more active right like it's i'm leaving here to go buy my new bike <laughs> so oh then we better make this quick <laughs> Because you have bike shopping to do. That's so, that's so fun. <laughs> Motorcycle or like riding bike? No, it's like a cycle. I, I was I was just telling my husband, I was like, I if if like is there anything more annoying than being vegan? It's probably being like a vegan cyclist. <laughs> and that's like my new hobby. <laughs> so this is how you look great. Noted. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> As promised, I am going to turn the show over to Tanya. Before I do that, I do want to ask one question. So what do you do again? Two, I like the two part question. What do you do? And secondly, can you tell us what you have accomplished in your and what you do or what, in your career? Let's make that a lot easier, right? What, what, what is your career and what do you do? Okay. So I am an executive producer and I work primarily in the unscripted space. So anything from um, reality TV, as you know it, or like um, documentary, feature documentaries, documentary series, anything that is not written um, is the type of TV that I work in. And um, so for the past, you know, I've been in the industry now for 18 years, almost 19. And um, I became, I worked my way up to becoming a showrunner, freelance showrunner. So I would get hired by um, networks to run reality TV shows. I would be like the EP showrunner person at the top. Um, and then in November of this past year, I got asked to um, become the vice president of current programming at Original Productions, which is a production company in LA that does unscripted docs, um, doc series, reality shows, stuff like that. So I took that and I've like, I'm like loving it so much, but it's a huge change um, from being like, you know, boots on the ground, like frontline producer to being kind of like producing on a more kind of like macro level. Um, but I have really, I've done all kinds of stuff. Like one of the things that I'm proud of about my resume is that it's like super diverse and I've done every type of genre of like unscripted TV that you can imagine from um, competition reality to dating shows to like um, uh, renovation shows, formats. I did like a financial rescue show that was really awesome. But I think what where my heart has always been is in telling stories about people. And so docu-series have been my specialty. Docu-series, family docu-series specifically, and also comedy, like those kind of three things have been my wheelhouse. And it's what I love, it's what I'm best at. And I think that, um, I think that I'm really meant for it because I see something really special in telling stories about real people, you know? And we have this whole industry that has like a horrible stigma, you know, reality TV is like maligned, right? I mean, people love it, but they also hate it. And they like, it's the ultimate guilty pleasure. Like people don't like to admit that they watch it because it's reality. Um, 
and it's become this beast, but like, or this monster. But what I love about it is that really like there's no other genre out there that can be so relatable to like everybody. You can literally reach everybody in the world um, on a level that, you know, scripted can't do. Um, and it, and it, and that makes me really excited and it also makes me feel like we have a responsibility. So I've always felt like, like I've always been really careful to choose the product. I'm not always because like I did rock of love, let's be honest. And like Tila Tequila, I did those shows like early on, but when I, when I really started kind of figuring out what I loved about the industry and, and what I, um, and when I had like the ability to choose, you know, financially and stuff like that, I started get, taking projects that I, where I thought that maybe I could make a bit of an impact. And that means like, you know, being very authentic with the way that I produce and making sure that the cast, if the cast isn't happy or they feel exploited or if they feel like things are like manufactured, stories are manufactured or their voice isn't being like properly accurately represented, then that's a fail. Like, so it's really important to me to work with them to make sure that they're always happy and always comfortable throughout. And also like, you know, audiences, viewers can smell bullshit. So it's important to me, it, you know, not just in the way that we produce the cast or produce the shows, but also the way that we edit it to make sure that we're not like chopping things up too much. We're not like frankenbiting to make things like, and things are, if you ever watch a reality TV show and it like sounds terrible, it's because we're like piecing interview bites together, which we have to. I mean, it's part of the editing process. But if viewers hear those edits, then it takes them out and they're like, oh, bullshit, turn the channel. You know what I mean? So that always, it's something that I'm always just like really aware of. And that's like part of my process with it. On to your show. I'm curious what your day-to-day -day looks like now that you're more a macro producer for this. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so... <laughs> It's like there's so much, right? Because I deal with everything from the creative, working with the showrunners and the teams, um, I, watching cuts and giving notes on the episodes before they go to the network. Um, I am also, but I'm also like um, overseeing the budgets and making sure that the budgets are, um, you know, that that we're that we're staying on top of the budgets. Like I'm over, I'm managing people who are managing that, but. Uh, also like putting budgets together before we send to the network for the first time. Like right now we're in the process of doing that. We just put together a budget, send it to the network, make sure that we are, that we, you know, once we send it off, it's kind of like, that's it, you know? So you have to make sure that we have everything that we need, but also not like, it's not too high. So the network doesn't be like, oh, well, I'll just take this somewhere else, you know, to get made. So it's <laughs> always like a little bit of a balance. Um, there's so many different processes. We also, um, besides like budgets and creative there's like there's scheduling and then there's like bo sessions that we have to book and then there's shoots that we're putting together and i just need i need to make sure that like you know our brand is being properly represented um working with the the showrunners to make sure that they know like you know that we're we're allergic to ge anything generic so it's like you know we are always trying to elevate so it's like okay we just hired you you're coming in to to start producing a, a new show for us, but um, we want to make sure that you're not going to be shooting the interviews to look like this, like how everybody shoots them. We want them to look like this or whatever, get, get more creative. And so we're, it's, for me, it's like a big part of the job is like mentorship in a lot of ways, you know, even though this like showrunner that is coming in knows what they're doing. They are brilliant and creative and smart and sharp and, um, and nurturing. That's what is needed at that level. But it's always about like, okay, how do you kind of unlearn some of the things that, um, that you've been like taught over the years that are kind of like bad habits? Like how do we like work that out of you? And to get to the point where we're all doing something like super fresh and exciting. Um, there's also, I'm also super involved with the diversity, equity, inclusion, um, council at, um, at the company. Yeah. And so we're putting together some like really exciting programs, um, that I'm super excited about. I've never been able to do that as like a showrunner, right. As a freelancer, I was never able to like, you know, I, it's like up to me, obviously to like hire, do it during my hiring, you know, and make sure that we're, that I'm doing that. And then, um, 
also kind of maintaining, you know, retaining these talented people. Um, but that's, but it's, I only have so much control, you know, and this, what we're doing is on a much, it's a systemic level now that we're doing things. So it's like so exciting to me. Well, we also have, oh my gosh. I mean, I'm, it's, it's cool to feel like, and I'm also backed by an amazing company. Like they really, really care. And I'm, I never see that, you know, Hollywood production companies are, and there's some that I love. They're like, most there's a lot of talk you know there's a lot of toxic um environments and personalities and in the, in the, isn't i know it's probably shocking to hear that but <laughs> no <laughs> but i i feel so anyway i'm grateful that the company that i'm working at doesn't do that and we also have some like cool um like an aggressive like environmental goals like carbon neutral and net zero goals and so like i'm working with people on that yeah and as a vegan i'm like coming in with like an agenda right so i'm like <laughs> i know a great way that we can meet our goals um so i am coming kind of coming in with some ideas for that too but and in, in terms of my day-to-day -day, it's a little bit of all of that or a lot of all of that so how much say do you have in acquisitions in your current position well, I am not, I don't work in development. So um, I don't have a lot of say. I do work closely with the development team, um, but I'm not a developer. I mean, I have developed shows and I've sold shows, but I um, at, like on my own before I was here, uh, but I don't work in development. So I, so I can no come in. It's part of your, your current responsibilities. Correct. And, and it is part, you know, I can introduce you know, the development team to, um, to people and to projects and stuff. And I have, but I'm not the one who is like really developing out the projects and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So Tanya, this isn't a good, this isn't the right person to pitch a reality show to, although you don't even have one. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I actually am the right person to pitch. Cause then I can like, I can push you along. You know what I mean? To, to the people who do. Well, the narcissist with Nona would like to know, don't you want to hear about my reality show that I have this great pitch for? Well, first let's hear <laughs> how to pitch you. Like what would be, what are your go-to tips for a successful pitch for you? Good question. Okay. Great segue. Yes. So, uh, the first thing is have, have a plan for story, have a plan for how point A gets to point B to get that gets to point C. I think a lot of times people come in with um, an idea for a show and they're just like, oh, because they they have this like this idea about a thing that hap has happened in their life. But that could be like just an event or that could be just a person and it's not a story. And you guys are writers, right? So like mm -hmm. I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't feel like you would do that. But like what is a story? not just what is the story for like, you know, multiple episodes, but what is the story the series arc? What is the series arc? But then what, what, where's their potential for more, right? Cause what we're looking for, um, what anybody is looking for is longevity, right? So does this show have legs and, and show us why you don't get a lot of time, right? So you have to be very buttoned up with like how this is going to be profitable, right? For like, for a network or for a production company. Um, so that's the number one thing. And coming in with some video is always the best. So creating a sizzle reel, um, that is much better than coming in with just like, here, I got an idea or like having even like a one page, you can totally do that. But like nothing speaks louder than video, right? And like, if you have an amazing cast, like let's see them, see them on camera show us what the show is, right? Um, you don't have to have the whole like arc laid out in this video, but giving us a vibe, are these people TV worthy? Um, is like, are they producible? Um, and then having something to kind of say, here's what the show is. And then you can do the rest in the pitch, right? You can like walk them through. But like having something on video means you're serious. You've taken the time to do it. And you're showing us that there's a show here. And then, and then we can make pretty much make a decision pretty quickly based off of that. You have anything on your wish list right now? Yeah. Um, we are all about, and for me especially, but even my company too, like we want to make shows that are going to create a dialogue and that are 
um, unlike what we've already seen. You know, something very fresh, something bold, something that is, you know, maybe underrepresented. Um, I people or ideas that aren't necessarily always talked about or given a platform. We are interested in that. You know, we want to be part of kind of changing the landscape of the industry in that way. So um whatever, whatever it is, just something we're, we never want to hear like. Like if we have to ask the question, what makes this different from X, Y, and Z, then we probably don't want it. If you have to ask, they didn't do their job in the pitch, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So I would like to jump in real quick. I, I promise. I, I know, Tanya, you have more questions. Oh, stop. You always Your research. show, go. <laughs> you research so well. But I just wanted to jump in real quick. And I remember I listened to a former interview of yours, and you said that you actually learn something from shooting uh, unscripted television, which oh, yeah. is one of the reasons I was like, got to talk to her because I've never heard anyone say that before. So what have you learned? Oh my How God. did you learn? So, yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's the other beauty about like working in reality TV is that, you know, you're working with real people and usually there's experts, you know what I mean? Usually you're putting experts in something on TV, right? So, um, this is a, my best example ever. I did a show called Life or Debt. This was years ago now. Um, but it, there was a financial expert. He was like a Fortune 500 strategist guy who is now just like helping families. And so he teaches families who are like struggling financially how to run their households like a business. So he comes in, takes all the emotion out of it and teaches them how to like look at it from like a business standpoint, look at their own finances from a business standpoint. And holy shit, I learned so much on that show. I complete, I, I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that like my future financial health was like not very good because I was like, <laughs> oh, I'm making money. It's fine. But truthfully, like I really was not on like a good path. And so I learned all kinds of tricks. I got out of debt, like pretty soon thereafter, based on like a technique that um, he, I learned on the show. I learned, I learned about, I'd, I, at the time I already owned a home, but I learned that if you live in California and you sell your home, if it's a, like your primary residence, um, you get to keep all of the profit, like up, or, you know, the profit's not taxable up to like $500,000, whatever. Anyway, that caused me to sell my house and buy a new house, like pretty immediately. And I learned a bunch of other stuff about real estate on that show. Um, so many things. So there's that. I did a plastic surgery reality show when I was, it was called Dr. 90210. I was 23, 24 at the time when I did it. And I did like five seasons of it. I learned so much about taking care of my skin, like, and thank God, cause I was young. So I like was able to like start like, oh, I was like, oh, I need to wear sunscreen, but also like, you know, get these like exfoliation treatments and do, and like, and then it just kind of sparked like an interest in it. So now I like stay up on those things. And then, um, you know, what else? I mean, there's, I've done so, I mean, I did a show about, about a mafia family. So I learned about stuff like that, like inside stuff that I never would have known, which is like super interesting. Right. Um, I, I worked on a show, but with a psychic. So I learned a, a bunch of stuff there, you know, which is, it's just, there's so much to learn from regular people just doing cool things. Um, and yeah, and oh, and I, so I did a show about female comics. Um, this is actually like one of my favorite shows ever. And uh, it was like really about the plight of female, females in a male dominated industry. And um, I'm really into comedy and that's the, those are the kind of shows that I wanna be doing, but it's like comedy versus like also with like a social issue, right? And that was really, really, really amazing. And the show won a Women's Image Award. And I was lucky enough to be able to like be the one that like went up and received it. So that was, that was awesome. But I learned a lot about comedy. Your LinkedIn picture, right? Your whole Yes. Before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so there's so much to be learned from, from, from this stuff. It's like, um, and I never would, you know, it's just like, I'm constantly kind of growing and it's like, it can be like really enriching. So I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you, what does it mean to hold yourself accountable to your dream? Mm. It means uh, forcing yourself to be uncomfortable, right? Like that's the biggest thing. I think like so many people, 
myself included, get very comfortable with things and then they just kind of stay. And then, you know, like when you're a kid and you're constantly um, learn, learning and discovering things and and so it's like you're you're growing and you're learning and you're you're growing to this point. But then like at some point, you know, we graduate college, we start working and then it's like you kind of sometimes you can kind of just stop. You guys don't know anything about that because you guys are constantly learning and growing and doing everything. But like as an adult, you know, holding myself accountable to my dreams means that I have to like jump off the cliff every once in a while. Right. Like I have to like just trust that that net will appear and that I will be guided in some way, whether it's just by my own confidence, you know? So that has helped me a lot for sure. And then talk to us about the importance of women's intuition. Oh man. Okay. I can talk to you a lot about this. <laughs> I'll tell you what, like I was just telling my mentee, I have, a, I have um, a, this woman that I'm mentoring who is like amazing and so smart. And the other day um, I was trying to get her to to come and executive produce a show uh, for at my company, for a show that I'm going to be overseeing. And she was deciding between this show and another show. And I was like, and she was like, I'm so, she was like, ah, I know, I don't know. And I was like, she's like, I would just feel so bad if I, and I was like, Andrea, you got to trust your gut. Like you have to, and, and, the, and you say like women's intuition, like women are compassionate. Like we are born with it. Like we have it we have compassion. And so that's why like a woman's intuition, I think is even more powerful. But one thing that I have learned over the past couple of years, but especially in this past year is trust my gut. I had, I got this job offer, you know, for, to, to be the VP of current uh, original productions, um, last year. And I got the call to come interview for it. And I did, I just, I, inter I was like, it's not really a job that I want to do, but I'm going to just interview for it and just see where, see what happens. And I was like very pleasantly surprised when I found out like how amazing the culture was at this company and all this stuff. Well, it took them four months between that first call that I did and the time that they made me the offer. And I'm a freelance person, right? So I, I was getting job opportunities, right. like offers that were like, yeah, just wait. You have to keep yeah. Going. And I was like, and I got this one job offer and I was so stoked about it. Cause it was like, I just watched the Paris Hilton documentary. And I was like, I was like obsessed. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. Like, are they doing another one? Is there going to be follow-up? And then literally like two days later, I got a call for the show to do this, this, this new show, Paris and Love on Peacock. And I was like, so stoked about it. And I was like, I, this is the universe. Like, this is so great. But there, and I mean, and I was at a company that I loved every, with like people that I knew and loved. And I was just like, so stoked. I was like, this is like my dream situation, whatever. And so I went through the interviews and then I got the offer and there was something in my gut. And I was just like, don't take it, don't take it. And I was like, what, why? And I have to, this is like, but really I was like kind of in my heart without even really realizing it. I was like holding out for this like VP job that, I wasn't sure that I was going to get, in fact, I probably shouldn't have got it. I've never done the job before, right? Like, I don't know how to be a VP. I know how to show run. So, but something in me was like telling me, and I was, thank God, brave enough in that moment. Cause the old me would not have listened to my intuition on it. My, the old me would have taken the show. And also I would have been like, not wanting to disappoint them and whatever, but I stood up and I was like, no, I'm going to turn it down. And that was so hard. But then guess what? I got the offer to do this VP job. And I'm telling you what, like, I've never been happier. So talk about like trusting your gut. I mean, that's advice yeah. now that I'll, I will give for the rest of my life. Cause it's like and the, the universe rewarded you. Yeah. The proof is in the proof. Like it is, <laughs> like it's true, you know, I'm telling you so good. <laughs> well, we are about out of time. So I have just two more questions for you. The first is what brings you joy? Um, being doing things like riding a bike and like doing kind of like childlike things, you know, being in the woods, hiking and like jumping around and dancing and having like going fast, driving fast or riding fast or whatever, like all of that stuff is like kind of taking me back when you, when I can like take myself back to my childhood, like that's when I feel like kind of carefree and the most joy. And last is what charities are important to you? 
the SoCal Bulldog Rescue is the number one most important nonprofit organization that I know of. Um, Advancing Law for Animals is another uh, charity that I care a lot about. Mercy for Animals is another one. Uh, the Humane League um, is important to me. Um, and I think those are the big ones for me. Well, thank you very much for sharing all of your expertise and your insights and your charities and your joy. Thank you so much. You guys are so awesome. And I love what you guys are doing. I want to say that doesn't time you do a great co-hosting. I was like, I had, I got to get up, get a sip of water and everything. Yeah, um, you, but um, you got to put your, put your beyond sausage on the grill. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, I actually did. Oh my God. <laughs> It'll, be, it'll probably be burnt by the time I'm finished, but you know, I, I actually did. Okay, I do have the last question, where, which is where can people find out more about you and what's next for you? Um, I love that the next phase of my life and career are kind of like up for grabs and that's exciting for me. You know, I will, I kind of feel like I'm going to stay in this path and, and see how much impact I can make um, on the production company level and see what growth is there for me. Um, I feel like there are many cool, cool shows in my future. Um, and you can find me on uh, Instagram at Prunkard, which is my last name, um, or Twitter at Prunkard, which is my last name. Um, and you can find me on TikTok at D Detroit Murph. And I haven't started making videos yet, but I'm going to very soon oh you know like as soon as you start making videos i'm gonna be like high quality videos i feel like, I thought, like producer style videos so, so much pressure <laughs> <laughs> oh, apparently that's what i do well so look at tanya she produced a great show she had a great show pressure you know, at the I, beginning that's the point i, of I was podcast. not doing podcasts and then she started asking me to co-host she <laughs> she and jay kept asking me to co-host and then they're like okay why are you starting your own show uh, I wasn't going to, and I ended up getting a literary agent, and we did start a show based on my blog, and I have them to owe for that. Oh my gosh, it's so, collaboration, yes, Eight. so good. I'm just saying, my pressure makes diamonds, the narcissist, yes. <laughs> something like that. I love, I just got chills, I love that, I'm going to use that, can I steal that? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I'll credit you, don't worry. <laughs> oh, thank you. Hashtag well, Nona is um anyway. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up for us over here. I'm well Nona and I'm one of the end I thought ladies. I do not know why I keep saying that because that is not the ending that Jade does. I always try to do her ending and it never turns out right. <laughs> and anyway, you can find out everything that your ladies are doing at www.andithoughtladies.com. When you go there, go down to the middle of the page, not the bottom of the page, to the middle of the page. And you can see the charities that we proudly support. We ask that at this time and with hardships and recovery that you at least try to support the charities as well. We thank you in advance for that. And remember, y'all, wisdom is all around you if you're open to finding it and accepting it. So peace and love, you guys, from Winona and the Missing Jade. Oh, yeah. Thanks for listening.